The 1930s was a simpler time. The United States was in the throes of the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl was wiping out livelihoods all across the plains, and entertainment was hard to come by. Yeah, I guess it wasn't that simple. This was the heyday of the traveling circus. When most people couldn't travel to go find entertainment and see things, the traveling circus brought the entertainment to them. One of the most popular circus attractions was, of course, the freak show. This wasn't like today when all you have to do is fire up the internet and blast your eye holes with all manner of human depravity in the comfort of your own home. Back then, you had to actually leave your house to see this kind of stuff. And they did. In droves. Sideshow attractions of the day ran the gamut from seemingly impossible physical feats to titillating, thinly veiled burlesque shows to, well, straight up exploitation of people with physical and mental disabilities. You know, I can't do this video without acknowledging there is a very, very dark side to this. You know, uh, a lot of people made a lot of money by exploiting people with physical and mental challenges and disabilities, by promoting them with misleading, insulting, and even racist themes. It's fair to say people had a different sensibility back then. But it's also fair to say that some of these sideshow performers did pretty well doing this. Some of them made a lot of money and made a very good living, became absolutely celebrities at a time when most people were struggling to find any kind of work whatsoever. And they did this with physical disabilities that would have made finding a job nearly impossible even at the best of times. The fact is we as humans have a certain curiosity toward the unusual and the grotesque. And that carries on today with our obsession with celebrities, plastic surgery disasters, and heartwarming BBC stories about children with two butts. So with that in mind, here are some of the most famous human oddities of all time. Robert Wadlow, the tallest man of all time. Born in 1918, Robert Wadlow was normal sized at birth, but by one year old he was already over three feet tall, at eight years old he was five foot eleven, and at thirteen years old he was seven feet tall. He was the tallest boy scout of all time. He was diagnosed with hyperplasia of the pituitary gland, something that's fairly common for people who are extremely tall. This is also known as gigantism, and it caused him to never stop growing throughout his entire life. He was hired to tour with the Ringling Brothers Circus in 1936, and he was often paired with little people on stage just to exaggerate his height even further. And he became a celebrity and made a good living doing this. He was eventually actually hired as a sponsor for the International Shoe Company, who provided him free size 37 shoes. Of course, living in a world that is built for people far smaller than you, posed many challenges for him. He actually had a lot of trouble walking around, but he refused to use a wheelchair because he just, you know, didn't want to be a guy in a wheelchair, but he wore braces on his legs to help him stand up straight. Another side effect of his size is that he lost a lot of feeling in his legs, and this is actually what did him in. These braces that he wore actually wore an ulcer into his ankle, which he didn't know about until it got infected, and his immune system was already pretty compromised because he was so large, and this is what caused his death. He died in 1940 at only 22 years old, as most people with this condition die very young. He was measured only 18 days before he died at 8 foot 11.1 inches tall, making him the tallest verified human being that has ever lived. General Tom Thumb. From the biggest to the smallest, General Tom Thumb was born Charles Sherwood Stratton in 1838. He stopped growing after only a couple of years for reasons that were unknown at the time, but he was discovered by P.T. Barnum and was taken to New York to feature in his uh, famous American Museum. At the time, he was five years old, but was only 25 inches tall and weighed 15 pounds. Barnum renamed him General Tom Thumb and created this whole mythology around him. He claimed that he was actually more like 11 years old and that he brought him over at great expense from Europe and that he was descended from royalty. P.T. Barnum was a giant liar. By the way, P.T. Barnum looked like this, and he was portrayed in the movie The Greatest Showman with this guy. So, the lying continues. Barnum and Stratton actually became very close friends and uh, business partners. They crafted this whole performance together and drew people by the thousands. Stratton was a natural performer. He did accents, he did impressions, he did song and dance, and he performed for Queen Victoria and Abraham Lincoln. In the early 1860s, he met Lavinia Warren, another little person, and they got engaged. And P.T. Barnum, of course, turned their marriage into this complete spectacle. It became a media sensation. Everybody paid attention to it. And, you know, it was a nice little escape from all the horrors of the Civil War that was going on at the time. Tom and Lavinia spent the next three years touring the world as some of the biggest celebrities of their time. They retired a few years later, and Tom Thumb died in 1883, a very, very rich man. Grady Stiles Jr., the Lobster Boy. Wasn't that story about Tom Thumb heartwarming? This is the opposite. 
Grady Stiles Jr. was born with a condition called ectrodactyly, which basically makes your hands fuse into things that resemble claws. But this wasn't unexpected for him, actually. His entire family had this condition, and they toured the sideshow circuit as the Lobster Family, and they did really well. They made $50,000 to $80,000 every season, and that was back in the 40s. Grady later fell in love with one of the carnival workers named Mary Teresa, and they got married and had two kids. But as Grady got older, he developed a drinking problem and became violent, abusive to his wife and to both of his daughters. But things finally came to a head when Grady's daughter, Donna, uh, fell in love and got engaged to a guy that Grady didn't particularly like. So the details are sketchy. Nobody knows exactly what happened. But one way or another, Grady confronted this uh, soon-to-be son-in-law and uh, shot him dead. Grady went to trial and totally admitted to his crime. But get this, he talked his way out of it. He actually argued that no jail could accommodate for his disability and therefore going to jail would be considered cruel and unusual punishment. And it worked. He got off on 15 years probation. And this story is just getting started with the crazy. Mary Teresa couldn't take it anymore. She divorced him, took the kids with him. He got remarried, had a couple more kids. That one fell apart because he continued to be abusive. And then for reasons that not even anybody in the family can explain, Mary Teresa remarried him. But after decades of getting away with literal murder, Grady had become a monster that thought he was above the law. And eventually, uh, Mary couldn't take it anymore. She and her son, Glenn, paid their next door neighbor, their 17-year-old neighbor, $1,500 to murder him. So on the night of November 29th, 1992, their 17-year-old neighbor, Chris Wyant, snuck into Grady's room with a 32 caliber Colt revolver and shot him at point blank range. The family was put on trial, and despite their testimony of years of abuse by Grady, and even Grady's own daughter testifying against him, the mother and the son were both given 12 years in prison, and the neighbor was given life in prison for murder. Grady Stiles the Lobster Boy was so disliked that the funeral home couldn't find anybody to be Paul Bearers at his funeral. Francisco Lentini, the three-legged man. Francisco Lentini was born in Sicily in 1889, one of 12 children. Technically 12 and a half, because attached to the bottom of his spine, was a parasitic twin. This gave Francisco a third leg, although there was a fourth foot attached to the top of that leg, which gave him in total three legs, four feet, 16 toes, and yes, two sets of functional male genitalia. Just face it, he's twice the man you are. He spent part of his childhood in a school for disabled children, which actually exposed him to kids who had things much worse off than he did, and it kind of gave him some motivation to do something with his life. He came to the US at the age of eight and became an immediate sensation on the sideshow circuit. Not content to just be stared and gawked at, he also did little physical feats around the stage. He would jump rope, he'd ride a bike, and he would kick a soccer ball around with his third leg while he was talking to the crowd. He was known for his wit and charm on stage and would often give interviews while sitting on his third leg just like it was a stool. And when people asked him how he bought shoes and pairs of three, he would say that he would buy two pairs of shoes and give one to a one-legged friend of his. Francisco got married and had four healthy kids and spent the rest of his life touring the country until he died at 78 in 1966. He was so well respected amongst his peers in the SciShow circuit that many of them simply called him the king. Myrtle Corbin, the four-legged lady. Anything boys can do, girls can do better, am I right? Myrtle Corbin was born in 1968 in Tennessee, and much like Francisco, she had a parasitic twin that was only developed from the waist down, which gave her two extra legs. She did have the ability to control her twin's legs, but they were very malformed, and in fact, each foot only had three toes on it. And she had trouble getting around, not just because of the extra legs, but she also had a club foot on her right leg, so even though she was called the four-legged woman, she technically only had one good one. She toured with P.T. Barnum, the Ringling Brothers, and was a featured attraction in Coney Island, where she, at her height, made up to $450 a week, which is $12,000 a week in today's money. Girl got paid. At 19, she married a doctor named Clinton Bickwell, who, upon consummating the marriage, learned a little secret, that much like Francisco, her twin was fully sexually developed, meaning she had two vaginas. Together they had four daughters and one son, and the rumor is that she gave birth to three of them from one vagina and, and two of them from the other. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but according to the book Anomalies and Curiosities in Medicine by George Gould and Walter Pyle, uh, it had been observed that she did menstruate from both, so I guess it's possible. Just imagine if she and Francisco had gotten together, huh? Huh? Damn it, now it's out there. I've said it, now there's porn of it out there somewhere. Haji Ali, the regurgitator. Some human oddities are born with physical deformities. And then there are the real freaks. Haji Ali was known as the regurgitator because um, he had a particular set of skills. I don't know who you are, but I will find you. 
I will drink you, and I will puke you. Yeah, Haji basically drank a three gallon pitcher of water and then spouted that water in six foot arcs all around the stage with pinpoint accuracy. And that's just how he started the show. He also had the ability to swallow several objects and then hork them up in any order you wanted. And he would swallow puzzles and hack them up soft. And for his finale, he would swallow a gallon of water and then a gallon of kerosene, then spout out the kerosene in front of a match, basically turning himself into a human flamethrower. He'd use this to burn down a miniature castle before using the rest of the water in his stomach to put out the flames. Regurgitation acts were not unheard of at the time, but most of them were considered very lowbrow, gross out kind of uh, performances, but Haji took this to a whole other level and made it an art form all his own. Now from blowing stuff out your mouth to blowing stuff out your ass, Lepetamine, the fartiste. Okay, so for anybody out there who thinks that modern entertainment has become way too juvenile and dumbed down, here's the guy who made a living literally playing music out of his ass. It's kind of the Victorian version of Owl My Balls. Born Joseph Pujol in Marseille, France in 1857, the story goes that he realized he had this ability when he was swimming one day and realized he could suck water in and out at his own will. I'm glad I wasn't in that pool. So he began to experiment down there and realized that over time and with practice, he could actually make it perform all kinds of different sounds. He started doing this just for fun as a comedy act around town and then he decided to get serious about it. It's so moving that moment when you realize your true calling. Within five years, he was playing at the Moulin Rouge in Paris under the name Le Pedemain, which is French for fart maniac. From there, he became one of the most successful and wealthiest performers of his day, so much so that he was able to open up his own theater. His act consisted of fart impressions of famous people, blowing out candles, hitting targets, and of course, lots of fart jokes. His big finale was he would stick a tube up his anus and then attach the other end of a tube to an ocarina and then play music and have the audience sing along with him, like you do. His popularity began to wane around World War I. For some reason, people just weren't in the mood for fart jokes, and uh, he retired from public life in 1914. When he died in 1945 at the age of 88, many medical schools clamored to get a hold of his body so they could figure out how he was able to do all this, but his family refused, saying, quote, there are some things which simply must be treated with reverence. Quick bonus fact, Mel Brooks named his character in Blazing Saddles, Governor Jay Lepetamane, after the great fartiste. Always makes me laugh. Alfred Langevin, old smoky eye. So puking guy, kind of gross, uh, guy playing music out of his butt, weird. This guy is just, what? Not much is known about Alfred Langevin. He spent some time at Robert Ripley's auditorium from 1933 to 1940. Uh, he was featured in their uh, pamphlets and in their materials, their marketing and whatnot, because he did this thing and he was kind of a one trick pony. He smoked out of his eyes. He could also blow up balloons and play a recorder with his eyes. Okay, here's a three trick pony. It was thought that he could do this because of an anomaly in his tear duct that actually allowed air to flow between his eye and his sinuses. Otherwise, he had perfectly functional eyes. It should be noted there is currently a Guinness World Record for squirting milk out of your eye. And the record is 8.745 feet, so apparently this is the whole thing. There's probably a hipster out there vaping from his eye right now. Schlitzy the Pinhead. All right, so yeah, this one is a bit more questionable, but again, these were different times. Pinheads were a carnival attraction that featured people with microcephaly, which causes your cranium to be smaller and grow to a point, hence the name. Microcephalics also usually feature developmental disabilities as well, often having the cognitive ability of around a four-year-old. And this is also what makes Zika so dangerous. Pregnant women who get Zika can have microcephalic babies. Now, pinheads in the best of cases played characters and performances, clowns and the like. And in the worst case, they were depicted as aliens or Amazons or Aztecs, usually with extremely racist overtones because of course they went there. But Schlitzy became an actual star. Schlitzy was a guy, but he was billed as a woman because he wore this dress-like garment because he was incontinent. But Schlitzy was loved by his fans and his friends alike because he had this sort of childlike innocence and exuberance that just rubbed off on everybody around him. A ray of sunshine is a term that got used a lot. And he just seemed to have this unconditional love for everybody that he met that was really endearing. He just, he just made you feel good. Schlitzy was even featured in movies, uh, including Tom Browning's Freaks, of course, with a lot of other sideshow performers, but he also was featured in The Island of Lost Souls with Bela Lugosi. Sadly, his caretaker died in the 60s and Schlitzy got put into an institution. He was discovered years later by Bill Unks, another sideshow performer, 
who found Schlitzy depressed and upset. He missed the, his friends on the sideshow. He missed the attention from fans. And uh, Bill basically worked with the hospital and the hospital decided the best thing for him was to put him under Bill's care and let him go back to the carnival. Schlitzy never stopped performing. It was said that in his final years, you could see him in the park outside his Los Angeles apartment, feeding pigeons and performing for anybody who happened to walk by. He just lived to make people smile. Chang and Aang, the Siamese twins. You've probably heard of Chang and Aang Bunker. They're so famous that to this very day, conjoined twins are often called Siamese twins, but their story is amazing. They were born in modern day Thailand. It was the kingdom of Siam back then in 1811. And as conjoined twins go, their conjoining was not that extreme. They just had a four inch band of flesh that connect them at the bottom of their rib cage. It looked like something you could just cut with some garden shears. They lived in a fishing village until they were discovered by a Scottish businessman named Robert Hunter who decided he could make a lot of money off of these guys. So he whisked them away to the United States, the land of freedom, eh, where they were basically slaves. They lived with Hunter's business partner, Abel Coffin, who toured them around the country as a standalone act, but Coffin and his wife pocketed all their money and they did all the work. So at the age of 21, they'd had enough. They wrote an FU letter to the Coffins and found a business manager who would work for them instead of the other way around and they took their show on the road. Over time, they became wealthy and famous and eventually settled down in South Carolina, married two sisters and had 21 kids between them. Yeah, I know, like how? Apparently they had a setup where they both had different houses on different plots of land and every three days they would go back and forth between those houses and when they were at Chang's house you know every, they did whatever he wanted to do he was like the the head of the household and then when they went to Aang's house the same thing so basically every three days they just kind of like shut down for the other guy and the sex thing has been uh, described by other conjoined twins apparently there's just a way that they have of just you know tuning it out but they were incredibly successful both professionally and personally I mean What's not to like about these guys? Oh, they own slaves. Oh, Chang, no. Yeah, after living for years in indentured servitude, they decided, eh, let's just pay that forward. Evidently, slavery was more of an investment strategy for them because they would buy kids when they were younger than eight years old and then sell them for more money when they got older. Of course, the Civil War came along and put the squash and all that, and they lost all of their investments. So for those of you out there thinking of investing in slavery, uh, maybe stick to an index fund. In 1870, Chang had a stroke and his health declined from there. From that point on, Aang basically had to just carry him around everywhere they went. And four years later, Chang died in his sleep. Aang survived for another three hours before he joined him. Now, it turns out that multiple times in their lives, they considered getting separated, especially after they retired from performing and were settling down with their wives. But their wives didn't want to do it because they were afraid it was too risky. They didn't want to lose them. So after they died, an autopsy was done. And they actually, it turns out, they, they both shared one liver that was separated between their, uh, their bodies. And today, they probably could be separated and would have been just fine. But back then, they probably would have died. So the wives were right. And last but not least, Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man. Few stories are as tragic as the true life story of Joseph Merrick. His story's been immortalized in plays, books, and films, often calling him John Merrick, but his actual name was Joseph. Born in 1863 in Leicester, England, he was actually normal at birth, but after about a year, he started to see lumps and weird growths show up on his face. By all accounts, his mother loved him and cared for him, but she died when he was 11 years old, leaving him with his abusive father. His father got remarried to a woman who was awful to Joseph. She insisted that he work for a living, even at the age of nine, 10, and he went to work at a tobacco factory and he rolled cigars until his hand was so malformed that he couldn't do that anymore. And then he traveled around and sold magazines door to door, wearing a sack over his face to not scare the people. Yeah, he still scared people. And he eventually left his family to make money in the only way he knew how, you guessed it, as a human oddity. He toured around England for a while with a local promoter named Sam Tor and eventually made his way into a shop run by a guy named Tom Norman where he basically had an oddities curiosity shop where he would shuttle people in and look at the horrible elephant man. The shop was right across the street from a hospital in East London and one of the doctors there, Frederick Treves, uh, became interested in Joseph. He came over and uh, asked if he could examine him. Joseph refused, but uh, Frederick left him his card just in case. Now during this time, Joseph actually made some pretty good money, but the public attitude toward freak shows was starting to shift. The morality police started going around shutting down shops like his. So he wound up touring uh, throughout Europe 
where he took on a new manager that left him in Brussels and stole all of his money. He made his way back to London, uh, absolutely penniless, and wound up causing a big commotion at a train station. The police took him in, and the only thing they found on him was the card of Frederick Treves, the doctor. So they called up Frederick, and Frederick took him into the hospital and examined him. On examination, Dr. Treves realized that this condition was slowly killing Joseph, and he probably didn't have that much more time. So he and the hospital put together a campaign where they raised money from the public to put him up at, uh, in accommodations in the hospital for as long as possible. And it was actually a, a huge success. They raised enough money to put him up indefinitely. And this is where Joseph's life finally sort of came around. They put him up with some really nice accommodations in a big room in the hospital. Uh, it didn't have any mirrors on Joseph's request, which is heartbreaking. And at one point, Frederick brought in a woman to meet uh, Joseph, and she shook his hand and he broke down crying because he said that that was the first time a woman had ever smiled at him and shaken his hand. Joseph actually had a pretty good life at this point. He spent his time reading, writing his memoirs, building model buildings. He had visitors from royalty like the Prince and Princess of Wales, and uh, Frederick Treves and him became good friends. Frederick found him charming and witty and highly intelligent. On the morning of April 11, 1890, a nurse came into Joseph's room and found him dead in his bed. He was only 27 years old. Now, the cause of his death was a dislocated neck because his head was so heavy when he laid down. Now, Dr. Trees believes that he did this on purpose because he normally slept sitting up with his head resting on his knees. The fact that he was laying in bed when he died made Frederick Trees believe that he did it on purpose. He just wanted to sleep like a normal person. Now, for years, people attributed Joseph's condition to neurofibromatosis, although later they decided that it was probably Proteus syndrome. Some, though, believe that he may have had both, or he may have had a whole unique thing that nobody else has ever had. His story, while tragic and heartbreaking, is also a testament to the indomitable nature of the human spirit. So, that was depressing. So which of these are your favorite human oddities? Do you have a favorite that I didn't mention? Are you horribly offended that I even talked about this subject? Let me know in the comments. I know you will. I've got links to stories about all of these people in the description down below, so if you want to know more, definitely go check that out. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, check out some of my other stuff. It's usually not this depressing. And if you like those, please do subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. Thanks so much for watching. You guys go out, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.